Good morning, everyone. I believe it's now my pleasure to introduce the next panel. Um, I will introduce our esteemed moderator, Harold Ho. As Cospero's managing partner, Harold believes that beneficiaries crave a foundation to building a social impact strategy that actually creates change, not just activity. He founded Cospero to help bold and compassionate decision makers design programs and services that create a meaningful impact while intentionally addressing systemic inequities. A proud alum and for, former student athlete of Ball State University, Harold began his career as an educator and football coach where he encountered many well-meaning services that were missing the mark because of unintentional misalignment with the end client. As he took on positions as a volunteer, nonprofit professional, and school system employee, Harold continued to grapple with the complexity of uncovering and meeting true community needs, all while strapped for capacity and operating within systems that often stifle innovation. Harold believes the path to true community flourishing takes everyone from the single mom in a food pantry to seasoned board members grassroots organizers to career politicians. Harold's gift is being able to find commonality and synergy with them all. In founding Cosparo, he saw an opportunity to take his knowledge and experience and build a bridge between the incredible vision and generosity of the social sector with the authentic underlying pain points of the community. I leave you guys in great hands and I'll turn it over to Harold. Thank you so much, Genesis, for the introduction. Uh, I am so excited to hear from this dynamic panel uh, this morning, as I'm sure each of you are as well. But before we jump in, we would be remiss if we didn't continue um, to take moments throughout our time this morning to honor Dr. King's legacy. Dr. King's legacy is often mentioned in the same breath as the incredible vision he shared with the world in his 1963 I Have a Dream speech. I imagine the words he shared in Washington that day were inspired by years on the front lines leading nonviolent protests and advocating for legislative justice. Before he mentions his dream that will forever engrave itself as one of the most incredible speeches, he says to the crowd, go back to Mississippi, go back to Alabama, go back to South Carolina, go back to Georgia, go back to Louisiana, go back to the slums and ghettos of our Northern cities, knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. Despite the jailings and public shame, Dr. King still found a way to share both the harsh reality of race in America and his sincere hope and optimism that racial justice would be recognized in this country. And while Dr. King was spearheaded landmark progress following the I Have a Dream speech, I believe Dr. King's 1967 speech entitled The Other America Should Be Our Guiding Light. It should serve as a call to action for many of us listening in today. In that speech, Dr. King shares, but we must see that the struggle today is much more difficult. It is much more difficult today because we are struggling now for genuine equality. And it's much easier to integrate a lunch counter than it is to guarantee a livable income and a good solid job. It's much easier to guarantee the right to vote than to guarantee the right to live in a sanitary, decent housing conditions. It is much easier to integrate a public park than it is to make genuine quality integrated education a reality. Those words resonate as much today in 2022 as they did in 1967. So today as we gather, we must not let our learning and reflection be in vain. The inspiration we collect from our brilliant speakers must nudge us to continue to create transformational opportunities that dismantle racial disparities. And with that in mind, we are going to dive into hearing from this all-star lineup who will be sharing with us about how establishing outcomes and equity-driven performance measures has guided each of their work and how we might continue to take that as a model across our systems. So let's kick off with very brief introductions uh, and we will start with Mr. Fitzpatrick. If you could share your organization and a bit about what you are responsible for in your role, um, and then we will move to Dr. Wilson. 
and then um, we will get we'll get started with our panel. Thank you. Thank you, Harold. Uh, first of all, just thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, thank you to the city for hosting this amazing event. My name is Jared Fitzpatrick, and I have the privilege to serve as the Senior Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for the Dallas Regional Chamber. In my role, I work with the DRC's over 800 member companies um, to really advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusion within their organizations at all levels, but also within the Dallas region, the community that we serve. Uh, so that looks a lot different depending on the day, uh, but every single day is dedicated to that goal of making Dallas uh, more inclusive and the best place to, to work, live, and do business. Thank you so much, Jared. Dr. Wilson? Good morning, good morning, and thank you, Harold. Um, I am Dr. Lindsay Wilson, and I serve as the Equity Officer for the Office of Equity and Inclusion Equity Division at the City of Dallas. My running joke is how many times do you say equity in one sentence? Um, but yes, so in my role, I, the Office of uh, Equity and Inclusion Equity Division is help shapes the city government in a Dallas where everyone can thrive. And we know that race and ethnicity predicts outcomes. So our office leads with race and ethnicity and really is a majority internal department that really helps other departments across the city of Dallas uh, understand equity in their specific role. So we lead efforts like the racial equity plan, budgeting for equity, and other uh, internal endeavors to help shape a city government where we're actually addressing the disparities that we see uh, via the equity indicators and other trusted data resources. Thank you, Dr. Wilson and Dr. Cordova. Thank you for being with us this morning. Well, buenos dias, good morning to everyone. Uh, I'm Susana Cordova and I'm the Deputy Superintendent for Leading and Learning in Dallas ISD. Um, and in my role, I oversee our school leadership team, our teaching and learning team, the Office of Strategic Initiatives and Human Capital Management. And all four of those teams are very focused on how we can advance our racial equity agenda. We know that as an urban district serving majority minority students, that the most important thing that we can do is create a safe, welcoming, nurturing environment of high expectations to in fact break the historical patterns of inequities so that all students can thrive. We know that there are examples of black excellence and of Latino excellence in our schools. What we need to do is scale that to ensure that every single one of our students reaches the highest potential. We have lots of bright spots and places where we are getting it right. And at the same time, we know that we need to extend those opportunities um, and those supports, particularly as we've seen the pandemic impact and disrupt um, the education for so many of our students. Thank you so much. As a former Dallas ISD teacher, I am so excited to have you here with us uh, this morning. Jared, we're gonna kick things off with you. If you could um, share a little bit about your role as a senior vice president of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Can you speak to the systems and structural changes that the chamber is undergoing currently to advance racial equity? Yeah, absolutely. So in order to answer that question, I have to go back a little bit uh, and, and share what we did in 2020 after the murder of George Floyd. Um, the DRC created our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Council, our DEI Council. And I think this is a really important structural change because I saw a lot of organizations creating DEI councils or task forces or committees, um, but we did ours purposely um, only at the board level. So we have uh, a permanent board level council that currently has about 60 uh, of our board members on it. Uh, and we also created it so that our board chair and the incoming chair for the next year would always serve as the co-chairs of that council. So it's, it's a very high priority for us and for our board members. Um, and we distributed those board members into four sub councils focused on diversity and leadership, community investment in underserved areas, education and workforce, and policing and criminal justice policies. Um, so that was a, the, probably the biggest structural change that we made 
uh, to ensure that it stayed high, stayed a priority for us. Um, obviously, hiring myself uh, was a big structural change for the DRC. And then uh, we also hired at the same time an SVP for community engagement, our partner in crime, uh, Tasha Heron Breath, who's amazing. Um, and then we expanded our team to include a manager uh, shortly thereafter. Um, we've, we've made some other changes in, the, in uh, adding more diversity at the senior level within the DRC, as well as increasing um, not just racial, but also gender um, diversity in our board. And so that's an ongoing effort that, uh, that we're, we're working on. Um, probably the biggest thing that we did to address some of the systemic issues was we worked with um, the Dallas Citizens Council, United Way of Metropolitan Dallas, uh, and the Boston Consulting Group, BCG, to launch a racial equity coalition. Uh, and the whole purpose of this was to use the resources that we had as you know, conveners of different groups um, to advocate for racial equity, specifically in Black and Hispanic communities, um, and really focusing on what the business community, what the private sector could do to leverage their resources. Uh, and so we can um, talk a little bit more about that. I know we have some further, further questions, so I won't go too much into it. Uh, but essentially, the, the whole purpose of, of that was to identify where are we uh, as a business community and what are the uh, levers that we can pull, what organizations can we partner with um, to start to drive some of that as a, as a business community. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm really excited to hear um, how the Chamber has um, been focused on pairing community engagement with this work of equity, because we know that's incredibly important. One is a follow-up, if you could share, as y'all begin that work, um, if you could speak to how important it is to establish uh, measurements uh, in your all's work that account for the disparities that we see in communities of color and in low-income neighborhoods. Um, the Chamber's taken a lot on. I would love for you to share with us just about how you are thinking about establishing measurements and aligning that with your commitments as an organization. Yeah, so we actually had the Brookings Institute come and speak at our State of DEI event last year. Um, we look a lot at the, the Brookings data. So, um, you know, based on this Brookings Metro Monitor they, they release every year, the Dallas region ranked 30, 30th out of the 53 largest metro areas uh, in racial inclusion um, because of mainly the gap between white workers and workers of color that continues to, to widen. Um, but the, I think the most interesting statistic for us was that we saw in that same report that geographic inclusion, we were rated 46 out of 53, uh, the metro areas. And again, just looking at the median household income, um, it, the gap had increased by 11% over the last 10 years, which is about $9,000. $9, um, so within that racial equity coalition, we, we looked at some of the more comprehensive data but also tried to see where we could find uh, data. Some of it was pulled from the equity indicators report. Um, and we, we tied it to five main areas. So it was economic, um, education, health, housing, transportation, and then criminal justice and uh, government. So within education, we looked at, or excuse me, within economic, we looked at the fact that uh, black and Hispanic residents typically on average have four to six times less the household wealth of white residents. Uh, and a lot of that is due to barriers between uh, you know, accessing capital or accessing banks uh, to create wealth. Uh, and an interesting point that we found in, if you, if you kind of split the city in half at, at, at I-30, Northern Dallas has 472 bank branches. But if you look below that, there's only 58. Uh, and so in, in Southern Dallas County. And so just literally being able to access um, the, the uh, brick and mortar system of, of wealth creation. Uh, so that was one of the, the, the areas of focus we had within economic. The other one we looked at was on us as we're bringing more businesses to the Dallas region. Um, you know, historically we have not uh, advocated for them to be in areas, um, mainly primarily within Southern Dallas County, if I'm being honest. Uh, and so that was a big push for us is not just in site relocations, but also in, in expansions. So as our businesses continue to flourish and become more prosperous, um, we want them to expand into areas that are traditionally 
under investing in. Uh, and so one of our goals was that 100% of the projects that we bring to Southern Dallas County um, would pay at or above a living wage, which is uh, $50,000 um, annually. Um, so that was a that was a, a measurement there. Education, you know, we we looked at the um, uh, achievement gap between uh, black students and white students uh, in star testing, and there was like a forty point achievement gap. Um, and, and so, and I think for white and Hispanic students, it was like a thirty point achievement gap. And so, we have an education and workforce department that's focused on on that, uh, and and again, convening people to help address that. Um, I thought it was interesting. Chair Schultz talked about health earlier and uh, shared that, you know, 37% of the Hispanic community in Dallas is uninsured compared to 9% of the white population. Um, we looked at life expectancy. So if you look at the life expectancy of a resident in uh, zip code 75215, for example, it's like 67, 68 years. Um, but if you go to Uptown 75204, uh, you're talking about a 20 year gap because their life expectancy is like 90 years. Um, and so we, we looked at that, we looked at the, the um, you know, absence of, of medical care options, medical deserts uh, in Southern Dallas County that can lead to more um, uh, chronic conditions or less preventative care just because there's a shortage of primary care physicians. Um, man, housing and transportation, we looked at mortgage interest rates, house come, uh, household income levels again, job growth, uh, which has again, traditionally been concentrated in some of the northern suburbs, uh, and and part of that is the public transportation system, which you know encumbers job growth. Um, uh, and then within criminal justice, we we looked at it from two angles. We looked at it from the the education perspective because uh, black students are um, like fifty percent of the uh, in school and and out of school suspensions. Um, and Black and Hispanic residents make up 60, 66, I think, percent of the Texas prison population. Um, and so we saw that areas of disinvestment are directly related to crime uh, incidents in, in Southern Dallas County. Again, so just thinking about how can we drive more investment into these communities. Um, the last thing I'll share, and I promise I'll shut up, uh, we, we launched a DEI assessment late last year. Um, really to understand what our business community was doing around internal DEI work, but also externally within the community. Um, and it actually closes on this Monday. So if anybody is interested in taking that assessment, it's not too late, um, and you can just send me an email. I'll, I'll post my email in the chat. But that was our way to really assess from a Dallas region specific uh, uh, lens, what is the business community doing? Where are the gaps? Where can we improve? But also where are the, uh, the people who are really driving the, the needle forward um, so that we can highlight as, as kind of a best practice. Um, so yeah, so that's what we've been looking at within our racial equity coalition, as well as uh, just as an organization. Thank you for sharing that. And I just want to just name how uh, incredible it is that um, the business community, right, is centering equity um, and the chamber is leading that work. Um, typically, we I anticipate that our, um, you know, our cities and our school districts should have a focus on it, um, but it's really great to hear that the business community, again, led by the chamber, um, is spearheading that, um, and I think that will generate great outcomes for our community, so thank you for, for sharing that. Dr. Wilson, we're going to go to you. Um, we often hear that one of the objectives to outlining clear action-driven performance-based measures is about specifically naming people groups. What is the city's approach to advancing equity and inclusion principles across departments? Great question. Thank you for that, Harold. And as you mentioned, it is critically important to name specific populations or people groups when we're discussing equity-oriented measures. And there have been specific frameworks that really highlight this importance. One um, that I'm thinking about in particular is the Government Alliance on Race and Equity, also known as GARE, who have been very clear in the role that disaggregated data, which disaggregated data is essentially breaking down information into subgroups based on race, ethnicity, and or other identities. But essentially, the, the critical role that disaggregated data plays in advancing equity, uh, specifically within city government. 
So to, to answer your larger question surrounding colorblindness, the notion of sameness and all, as an Office of Equity and Inclusion, it is our role to support departments in understanding how harmful it is to communities of color and lower income neighborhoods when we don't fully understand the unique challenges and disparities that communities face right, which can truly be captured through the collection and the breaking down of data. And I would say more importantly, once we have that data that demonstrates where there are disparities, then we move to setting clear cut goals around addressing those specific disparities and the populations that we are seeing the largest or the greatest disproportionality. So our department really, really centers four key principles when thinking about equity measures and the work that we do just in general, which is using the disaggregated data or disaggregated data and community input. And if I could just, again, take a moment to, to note, um, when we talk about community input, we are truly talking beyond this notion of educating the community, but really looking at how we can consult, collaborate, and make shared decisions to see how our daily work either benefits and, and burdens communities of color in lower income neighborhoods. Um, and so you'll see this, this, this in several of the resources and the work that our division not only does, but supports other departments in doing, which really challenges this notion of colorblindness and, and, and amplifies how harmful it is to addressing disparities and advancing equities. And so when you're thinking about some of the resources that uh, our department leads, like uh, the equity indicators report, right, which really identifies based on race and ethnicity, and then how we utilize that report or this report to really guide the work that we're doing with other city departments. Last year, one of our Dallas 365 goals was every city department would go through and align their, their either uh, a service uh, policy or program to the equity indicators. Um, as Chief Liz mentioned earlier, uh, our notion is equity is everyone's work despite or in spite uh, how internal or community facing you are as a department, we all have a very critical role in transformative change. Um, so I would say that a lot of the work that comes from our department, again, we're a majority internal department that supports all 43 <laughs> departments in the city of Dallas. But a majority of the work that we do, if not all of the work, excuse me, not a majority, all of the work that we do really challenges this notion of colorblindness, particularly when we're talking about measurements. And so again, I amplified the resources that, that we led as it regards to the equity indicators report, but some of the other things that we do, uh, budgeting for equity, where again, our department supports other departments and centering the, earlier mentioned key principles that I mentioned uh, in their budget decisions, right? Or if you think about the Office of Equities and Inclusions Equity Impact Assessment Tool, where we were specific in naming people groups, right? Which really allowed us to be intentional with the allocation of limited resources. Um, and then as you know, as a, as a uh, partner in this work, as we are embarking on this racial equity plan to which we are meeting with every single one of our city departments, uh, again, we are being explicit in the, in the need to name populations or specific people group as we are establishing those measurements. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Thank you, I'll Dr. Stop there. Yeah, I, I want I'm excited that you the racial equity plan was mentioned quite a bit in the uh, first panel and the excitement around it. Um, obviously, our team at Post Barrel is deeply familiar with it, but could you share um, with our audience this morning more uh, specifically about um, what will go into the performance measures that will live uh, in the racial equity plan that will be released uh, to the community later this year? 
Absolutely. And yes, I too was excited to hear all of the momentum around this racial equity plan. So thank you for this opportunity, uh, again, to highlight the work that we're engaged in. And I know that we'll do a little brief. Uh, I'll be brief because we'll do a little more at the end to actually get into the nitty gritty of where we're at in this process, but also what exactly the racial equity plan is. And so just again, as uh, some background information, on March 24, 2021, the racial equity resolution was passed, as was mentioned by Vice Chair Thomas earlier. Uh, and within that resolution, it called for a racial equity plan. And so the Office of Equity and Inclusion is leading that effort to which we are working but alongside of COSPERO, both internally with all city departments, but also at the same time, externally. And so I know it's been said several times, but I'm gonna say it again. We are onedallas.org. If you have not went to the website, please take a moment, take this moment right now to go to the website so it's locked in your browser. Because on that website, you can leave live uh, feedback on what you wanna see in this plan, but also there's an opportunity to request additional uh, information from our team, from COSPERO, um, and also to see where the community conversations are happening. So there is a live calendar there. But uh, now that I, I put that plug in, <laughs> I'll step back and, and talk a little bit about the resolution again, which we know reaffirmed the city's commitment to both understanding equity and most importantly, addressing the disparities through city departments, daily services, budgets, and other endeavors. And so what this racial equity plan will do is it will allow all of our residents as well as our other key stakeholders to pick up the plan, which we are also really uh, terming it as a strategic framework to see exactly what each and every one of our city departments are doing to move the lever on closing racial and ethnic disparities. And so it is our goal, we are aiming that at the very end of this plan, anyone can pick it up and say, this is how this impacts my daily life. And so this is why we need your input. Um, right now we are having internal community conversation or internal conversations with our city departments. And we are really leveraging the information that we are getting from that We Are One Dallas website to inform those conversations will establish some measurements. And within those measurements, the Office of Equity and Inclusion and in partnership with COSPERO are holding a strong boundary uh, with our departments around naming specific people groups, providing baseline information, and then outlining what the actual goal it is uh, that, that that department will be working towards in the next three to five years. And so we're really leaning into our community around uh, measures of accountability, how community members would like to be notified on the progress of the plan once it's implemented uh, and so forth. And again, I'll stop because I can take up the whole hour talking about the REP, Racial Equity Plan. Thank you for sharing that. And um, as Dr. Wilson mentioned, there will be uh, later this, um, before we wrap up today, uh, there will be an opportunity to hear more about the details of the racial equity plan. Uh, so if you're able, please stay tuned for that. Uh, Susanna, we're gonna go to you. Uh, um, Council Member Resendez mentioned this in his time uh, on the Dallas ISD school board, that Dallas ISD um, was, was, it is leading the charge across the, uh, in the country uh, for school districts that are pioneering racial equity work uh, within the educational arena, uh, both in policy and through organizational change. I would love for you to speak to Dallas ISD's short, mid, and long-term uh, equity-based performance goals um, and how you are thinking about aligning those um, to you know, workforce solutions to make sure that our children are, are prepared uh, for the future. 
Yeah, thank you. And um, I just have to take a moment to say it's incredibly inspiring to hear the work that's happening um, in our city and the work that's going on in our district, I think will be a really strong complement to what you've just heard from Dr. Wilson and from Mr. Fitzpatrick. Um, so in 2020, um, our Board of Education took a very powerful step to um, adopt a racial equity policy that helps govern the work, um, including the creation of a racial equity office that has focused on both short-term, mid-term, and long-term practices, both in policy, in resource allocation, and in practices for our organization. Um, in the short term, the first thing we knew that was going to be really important was to do a very um, intentional asset mapping of the most effective practices that are helping achieve racial equity for our organization so that we could make sure that we were investing and sustaining in those things. As an organization, we're incredibly diverse. Over 70% of our students are Latino. 21% uh, of our students are African American. We have a very high number of students um, who are emergent bilinguals. And our racial equity agenda is both intersectional and specific. Um, and I think it is really important to name that the work that we do needs to advance a racial equity agenda. There are many things that we can do that will support all students, um, including creating uh, classrooms and schools that affirm the racial, ethnic, and linguistic identities of our students. But then there are other things that we need to do very specifically for different groups of kids. Um, and what an emergent bilingual student needs to advance a racial equity agenda is different than what an African-American student needs um, to do that. Um, and there are places where that's gonna overlap and there are places where we need to be very intentional and um, differentiated in our approach. So in the short term, we wanted to make sure that we were mapping and um, those existing strong practices to continue them. Um, we wanted to then expand those practices. That's our midterm work is to really expand the work uh, that we know is most effective. And then long term, we're looking at how we can find new practices to add to the work that we're doing to help ensure that we're accelerating the progress um, for our students. Um, there are three foundational things that we believe undergird all of that work. Um, the first one is we need to invest in equity mindsets. Uh, people come into education, I believe, because they want to make a difference, but that doesn't necessarily mean they know what it means to have a cultural lens on supporting students um, who may look and have lived experiences are different than the ones that they bring um, as an educator. And so we want to make sure that we're helping develop all of our educators through training um, around uh, cultural competence and uh, cultural knowledge. Uh, we want to make sure that we are meaningfully engaging with stakeholders. You know, we exist to serve our community and our community needs to have a voice at the table in how this work unfolds. Um, there are obviously best practices based on research and we think it's really critically important that we reflect the lived experiences of our communities um, and that our community partners um, help shape that agenda and the work that needs um, to happen. And in fact, frankly, making sure that our community partners um, have a seat at the table in terms of policy creation, but also in terms of the kind of services that we deliver to our students will make a meaningful difference in how students receive that education. And then finally, the third thing that we try to make sure that we're always doing is measuring, monitoring, and reporting on progress. Um, it's one thing to have plans, it's one thing to engage in training. If those do not translate into changed actions and different results, we will not get to where we need to be to truly create the kind of uh, future for our students that we know is critically important. In terms of like how we can do that work um, to help the workforce of the future, you know, a lot of it is we need to make sure that we have equitable outcomes every step along the way. That's making sure that our African American students are reading at third grade, as well as making sure that our um, students in high school have opportunities both for advanced academics, as well as work-based learning that will help them in the long-term uh, for their long-term success. And so um, those are some of the short, mid and long-term efforts that we're engaging in and the ways that we're really working on helping advance the agenda for ra racial equity in Dallas. Thank you for sharing those and y'all are well on your way uh, in the work. You know, one of the things that comes up a lot, um, both internally and externally, that I'm curious to know from Dallas ISD's experience uh, is the word accountability, right? Um, can you talk a little bit about how the district has consulted with the community 
um, around the measures that you're tracking towards in regards to accountability? Yeah, thank you. Um, and it is critically important that we have accountability, both around engagement with our community, but also in terms of how we are setting goals and monitoring progress toward them. Um, so um, as I mentioned in 2020, the Board of Trustees adopted a racial equity policy, and that resulted in the creation of a stakeholder-based committee um, the trustee appointed advisory committee that meets both on the racial equity um, office agenda, but also we consult with the TAC on lots of the different bodies of work that are happening um, in our district. Um, I mentioned before that I think this work is very intersectional um, and it is really important that we have like very specific racial equity work that's happening that comes out of the racial equity office, but it's also important that the work in teaching and learning reflects the racial equity agenda. That when we get federal funds um, to help accelerate learning that we consult with the TAC to get their input on how we can do a better job to meet the needs of our diverse students. So that committee um, created an opportunity for all of our trustees to appoint members um, to it. And then we also have some at-large members uh, who um, round out that committee um, uh, based on an applicant pool of people who live here in Dallas. Um, and uh, we also have two student participants on the um, trustee ad appointed advisory committee. So they helped us formulate our goals. They monitor our progress. Um, and as I mentioned, we consult with that group on um, many different areas. I'm gonna actually drop in the chat our public facing website where we post all of um, our goals and how we are monitoring progress in a very public way. So anybody can actually get onto this website, um, see the goals that we've laid up, out for ourselves and where we are. We definitely have made progress and we still have a long way to go. Thank you for sharing that. There are so many resources being dropped in the chat this morning. So please uh, grab those and um, star them in your browser. I'll certainly be taking a look at that resource um, as we uh, work on thinking about communicating the progress on the racial equity plan. I have a question that I would like um, any of the, I'm gonna open the floor, um, but maybe start um, with whomever may want to uh, respond first. But one of the thing is we know that there's a lot of energy and work that goes into this internally. Um, and there is no way you can make the progress that both the city and the district and the chamber uh, are making um, without having some challenges along the way, right? And so the question for the group here is, can you speak to the ways that your organization overcomes challenges um, when you're working on establishing equity measures? Understanding in, in institutions as large as the ones represented here today, um, leaders might be at very different parts in their understanding of racial equity. Um, so how do you navigate that when you're trying to get to a point where you are developing and adopting specific equity measures? Um, that is what I would love to uh, just open the floor to any of our um, panelists to, to uh, respond to that. I guess I'll go. <laughs> um, since I didn't see anybody else call for me. So um, I'll be honest, I don't have a great, great answer for this one. Um, I think we have the the history of institutional racism in Dallas is not new. It spans over a, a century. And there's a lot of compounding effects um, for people of color in our community. And I think, you know, the first thing that we had to realize or, or come to terms with was that um, our organization, a lot of the organizations that are kind of institutions in Dallas um, were contributing uh, or, or were implicit in creating some of these inequities um, throughout our history. Um, and these are, these are things that create a perpetuating cycle. And, uh, and so we know we couldn't solve it alone. Um, and so I think the one of the challenges for us was actually uh, getting other people from the community involved in what we were doing. Um, because again, we just, we had not really leaned in on this uh, as an organization before. Um, and so we had to go and kind of talk to the city, education institutions, um, healthcare organizations, nonprofits, 
um, other some of our members who had been doing this work for a lot longer than we had, um, and and just recognize you know what we don't know or or what we have been um, uh, you know some in some places not really fulfilling where we where we um, our promise. So so I would say that the toughest part for us was um, uh, really just building consensus and and truly ensuring that we were doing this work. Uh, from a place of authenticity, not just to check a box or because it was it was popular at the time and there was a lot of social pressure. Um, I guess the, the other challenge is, you know, when we talk to some of our CEOs and, and other senior leaders uh, of, of our member companies, as well as other organizations we partner with, um, I think we, we sometimes have to help them understand that economic prosperity and, and growth must result in more equal opportunities uh, for all of our citizens, regardless of their background. Uh, and that includes closing disparities by race uh, and, and space. Um, and so we've had to like have really baseline conversations about what equity is, because when we, sometimes when we ask, um, you know, I'm surprised that uh, people define it as, as just giving everybody the same support, which is equality, right? Um, but but truly helping people to understand that in order for us to say we, we care about racial equity and to actually make any impact, we have to address the underlying policies, processes uh, that may disadvantage or favor one group. Um, and so it's really been uh, a journey in, in helping everyone that we're working with, as well as our internal staff to understand that not everyone uh, uh, starts at the same level and to really ask the question, What's keeping some people out of the room or, or out of the conversation? Um, and so just, I guess, really framing what we're doing when we say we're prioritizing uh, equity and racial equity. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Dr. Wilson, go ahead. Yeah, no, absolutely. If I can just build off of a number of things um, and, and, and sorry for the the pause, right, in the question, because I think it's that overcame any challenges, right? And so um, we know that this work, this work being equity work is both a process and an outcome. And I would certainly say that each day brings on its own unique challenges. Um, but as Jared mentioned, a couple of those is uh, the, the, the nuance between equity and equality. And I really like the concept of equity mindsets and, and how that was broken down. Uh, when we think about the work that we do internally uh, as an office of equity and inclusion, it's almost like working with 43 different organizations or, or, or businesses, right? Uh, thinking about just the nuances uh, in each department and the work that they do on a daily basis and, and understanding the variation of one day we may be ready to set those hardcore uh, equity measurements, which speaks to the key principles of naming people groups and having baseline data and where we're going and, and the accountability piece. And, and in other cases, we're really um, normalizing the conversation. And when I say normalizing the conversation, I'm specifically speaking to uh, talking about race, right? Talking about race in relation to the service delivery or, um, ex or discussing the difference between equity and equality, uh, particularly when we're thinking about commitments, right? And investments, when, when it's time to start, you know, looking at money and making other decisions, uh, that's when the conversation uh, becomes uh, particularly interesting as, as it relates to if we're talking about the same thing, if we're actually talking about equity, or are we talking about equality, giving everyone the same exact thing or service. Um, so those are some of the things that uh, I think goes into the work before we can get to those clear cut measurements, right? And if we try to establish measurements on the front end of it without um, clarifying those nuances, those differences, then we have measurements that um, either we can't commit to or don't really speak to those who have the greatest need. Uh, another thing that I, I guess I would like to highlight is as we're talking about establishing equity-driven measures, 
Uh, I think it's particularly important uh, to keep the conversation around institutional changes, right? Like our structural changes in lieu of uh, talking about changes in communities, right? So like that uh, individual behavioral myth of if communities just did this different, right? Or let's just educate communities. Um, and so when we're talking about establishing equity-driven measures, we're actually talking about what we need to change internally so that we can close the disparities that we know that our communities experience because of the disinvestment, disinvestments, excuse me, um, particularly that we've seen in government. Uh, and so uh, when you say overcame, uh, that's kind of what, <laughs> what caught me up because we have had major wins, right? Um, when we're thinking about the work that we're doing, uh, but this is a process. And so um, with each, each win, there is another layer to that onion that we have to pull back and, and, and recenter. Uh, and then the last piece before, or maybe I'll stop there because I think we have closing mark. So I'll stop. Can I just build really quickly on something that Dr. Um, Wilson just shared? Um, you know, I have found that Dallas ISD is very open to this. So the challenge is not in setting the goal. The challenge is not in monitoring the progress. I think the challenge really is in creating the coalition to make sure that our aspirations are matched with our efforts and our results. And I just want to build on um, something that I heard because, you know, um, Mr. Fitzpatrick said, like, we have a century of the legacy of um, segregationist impact in policy and disinvestment in communities. The more that we can work collectively on deep investments in neighborhoods that have historically been um, denied access and opportunity, the more likely it is that we're gonna be able to see the impact of what we are all individually trying to achieve. That's hard work. Um, it's hard work, as I mentioned, like on the equity mindset, I think people are very well-intended, but are not always very effective. And the more that we can do to create that kind of coalition where we wrap our arms around the, the communities that are most in need of being lifted up, the more likely it is that we're gonna be able to get the kind of results that we are all looking for. And it starts uh, you know, at birth um, when we think about the neighborhoods that have the least access to quality early childhood education, it's through K-12, it's in workforce development, it's in housing. Um, several people in the chat have talked about environmental justice, it's in like, what's the quality of the air that you breathe? Like all of these things fit together. Um, and I think it's really challenging to think about how do we create the kind of approaches that uh, build seamless um, supports for the underserved communities. Thank you so much for sharing that and, and wholeheartedly agree. I'm going to pose one more just open question uh, for our panel um, to respond to. Uh, our team has been doing on this project and many others a lot of community engagement. And one of the things we hear often from our community is, and, and it's very common to hear, um, is that you know everything starts at the top, right? That uh, is very important for leadership to have buy-in around um, any all things, but especially as they're related to any equity uh, efforts happening inside of an institution. So what I would love for the panel to speak to is the significance of leadership and executive uh, understanding of the concept of equity, uh, moving from just their understanding of equity to equity driven measures, right, that we actually are trying to measure towards outcomes, because there is a lot that happens around trainings, right, and folks sort of having an understanding of what it is, but what we're talking about is then how do we put that into action and measure the outcomes of that? Um, so I would love to hear from this, um, from the panel um, here around, you know, what is the significance of leadership and executives in organizations being able to have a full understanding of that progression, right? From deepening uh, their understanding of equity to equity driven measures. I'll kick it off again. Uh, so, so I think this is incredibly important because to your point, um, when the CEO is bought in, people move, like things happen so much faster than when it has to be this kind of grassroots uh, uh, 
um, effort that you know is fighting against a CEO or a senior leader who doesn't really understand why or doesn't want to invest in it. Um, so, so I think you know the the concept of equity again, just to kind of harken back to my previous point, is incredibly important to ensure that the leader understands. And and it, it depends on your industry, right? It might be different for for uh, different industries as to what equity actually looks like um, uh, within that sphere, but. I would say that then taking it a step further to give them tangible um, metrics or examples that they can understand. So, for example, um, one of the things that we talk about a lot is uh, talent and the need for more equity in how our organizations are recruiting talent um, into their to, into their workforce. Um, and so we share specific numbers, right? Where um, it, they can they can get it. So we say you know share of black and Hispanic workers um, uh, in Dallas. You know it's sixteen percent um, black in terms of the workforce. The, the workforce that they can pull from twenty seven percent Hispanic. Um, but when you look at management roles or leadership roles, it's eleven percent black and uh, it's fifteen percent um, Hispanic. And so like we paint the picture for them of if you are able to close this by one percent. Like here's the pool that you can pull from. Here's the specific organizations, the pipeline organizations that you can work with. And here's the benefit to you um, by working with one of those organizations and reducing your cost to hire or potentially you know, having an employee if you built an organization that's uh, also inclusive, um, having an employee that is going to be more uh, sticky to your organization. Um, and then we talk about you know, tech roles because they're high job growth um, high earning potential, right? And so we share those same numbers, but then say, you know, um, for black workers, it's 12% of tech roles uh, uh, that they actually occupy. And I was so glad that um, council member Thomas brought up 110 because, you know, we've been actively engaged with them behind the scenes. Uh, and so that's one of the examples that we can point to um, for how you can drive um, uh, racial equity by bringing people into your organization. Um, uh, so, so anyways, I, I think that whenever you're making the case to a senior leader, it has to go beyond just that this is a good thing to do and really help them understand what is the bottom line impact if it's a private sector corporate company or what's the impact within that community and how is that going to close the, the racial equity gap, but also how is that going to help us? Uh, and so we've been very like clear, you know, um, increasing wages for, for your lowest paid workers, um, implementing like clear promotion um, ladders so that people know what's required of them to move into the next level. Um, so there's equity around that promotion and, and uh, advancement. Um, some of our banking partners, we talked to them about, you know, eliminating the use of credit scores in their pricing models, um, which gets to that bias again, uh, that, that penalizes marginalized groups to access fair lending. So, so yeah, so I think just taking it from the conceptual to like specific example that uh, resonates with their business or with their organizational mission um, is, is what we found to be effective. Thanks so much for sharing that, Jared. Anyone else wanna take a stab at that? I'll just say really briefly, you know, the, the power of having a board of trustees, you know, in a public organization like a school district, you know, having trustees who are deeply committed to this, who have explicitly named goals that have disaggregated um, views to sit at the board table and talk about our results um, and what we're trying to do about them is very powerful in terms of helping move an organization. Um, and um, I really want to commend our board of trustees for their work on, you know, a laser focus on what are we doing to accelerate progress for our African American students and our emergent bilingual students, because we know that in the absence of that focus, we're just never going to achieve the kind of equity that we're looking for. It absolutely starts at the top. Absolutely, and I would echo the same. Um, I, I have the, the honor of working with equity officers uh, across the, the country. And uh, one of the things that is very different here in Dallas is that we have the leadership 
um, that really supports uh, equity and that equity on a surface level, right? Like we know it's one of our core values, but then there's actionable steps like the Workforce Education and Equity Committee um, and, and, and all of the support that we received from our city manager, TC Broadnex, uh, to, to embed that in all that we do, whether it be budgeting for equity and we're one of four cities who are doing it on an annual basis. And that's part of the conversation that I have when I'm talking with other equity officers is surrounding how do you get your departments to participate? How are you getting um, departments to buy in? And while I would like to take credit, I can't because it's really coming top down. Um, it's not just a core value. It is something that we live every day as we're looking at our policies, our procedures, uh, our, our decisions that we're making both as it regards to investments and the, just the daily services that we're, that we're offering. Um, so, so I would say that, yes, it is it's critically important and you can tell the difference um, in, in the work. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilson. Um, I would like to open the floor for closing remarks. There are 200 plus guests with us here uh, this morning. I would love for you all to leave them with uh, encouraging words or uh, food for thought as um, there's folks from, you know, the business background to, to grassroots organizations and to our residents who are, who are living and working and um, worshiping across our city. Uh, what is your encouragement to them and how they might be able to take um, this conversation and to apply it to their day-to-day -day life as they pursue um, equitable outcomes? for themselves or for their organization. Um, I would love to um, start with, uh, Susanna, if you wanna start with the closing remarks and then Dr. Wilson and then uh, Mr. Fitzpatrick. Um, so I really wanna thank everybody um, on this panel. I'm incredibly inspired by the work that you're leading um, and as well as all of the people who've attended this panel. Um, the most inspirational thing I think that we can say um, about the work that we're doing in the Dallas ISD is that we are not doing this work alone. We are doing this work in a city that is deeply committed to a racial equity agenda, in a city that recognizes the impact of, of the disinvestments and a city that is very committed to making changes um, to that. I'm a relative newcomer to Dallas. Uh, this is my one year anniversary this week of having joined the Dallas ISD. Um, and every step of the way, I've been so inspired by how openly and how committed our community is to talking about how do we make changes in South Dallas in, uh, in particular, because we know um, that it's critical to the success um, of our city. And so uh, our school district is here poised to, to do that work with you. Um, and we welcome your, um, your critical friend relationship with us. And uh, we need that. We're a big organization. I always say big organizations don't always change because they want to. We need people inside and outside to push us uh, to accelerate the changes that we know are so critical for our students to be successful. Absolutely. I, I would say equity is everyone's work. And so it is critically important that we all uh, do our part in closing the racial and, and, and ethnic disparities that we see. Uh, the other thing that I would add is that it is great to be able to uh, identify where those disparities exist, but in order to uh, actually address them, we have to move to measurements and, and accountability. Without accountability, then we can't advance equity. And so I think it's critically important um, for all of us on this call, as well as all the attendees, to look at uh, what your role is and in, in, in supporting in measurements and, and the accountability efforts to close the disparities that we know are very pervasive here in the city of Dallas. And I feel like I've long talked to every question, but I love talking about this stuff. So I'll be brief. I'll be brief. Um, I'll just echo Dr. Cordova and say, you know, I don't think there's any way we can move forward alone. We have to work together if we want to make any real impact in reversing these issues that, again, have been pervasive for over 100 years within this city. 
Um, I love looking at what other cities are doing. So sometimes I think the best ideas or, or you know, initiatives can actually be something that we look at another city and see how they've implemented it and bring it into to our own uh, infrastructure. Um, I'll close with a, a, a MLK Jr. quote, which is actually a, a summarized from a sermon that he had. Um, our lives begin to end the day that we become silent about the things that matter. Council member talk, Thomas talked about this. You know, we all have to get on board and use our voice to make it an impact uh, and to advocate in the spaces that we have influence in. So you don't always have to be an elected official or a CEO to make impact or to make the decision. Um, I believe we all have a voice and we all can make that voice matter. Um, last thing, I would encourage everyone to attend Dallas dinner table on Monday evening on MLK Junior Day. Um, I've supported for the last five years, the DRC has supported for the last 20 years. Um, and it's a great opportunity to use your voice and your story to impact the lives of others. So ho hopefully we'll see you all there. And I'll post links to all the stuff that I talked about uh, in the chat. Thank you so much to this incredible panel. I know if we were in person, uh, all of these folks would be on their feet giving you a round of applause. Um, but we are so grateful for the insights that you were able to share with us. Um, and for all the work that you're leading each and every day, um, this is a very much, um, it's, it's great to be able to sit back and reflect, but we know that the work is hard um, and it takes um, inspiration and time to sit and reflect um, like during this MLK um, celebration that we can recharge our batteries so that we can do it. I love Council Member Thomas's uh, demonstration in the first panel where, where he said, roll up the sleeves, right? Um, that is what we've got to do and to continue um, to, to trek down this path. Um, it's not easy, but it can be done. And so I hope that all of you listening in were able to take the energy um, back out into your individual spheres of influence uh, and continue to work to create the systems and, and structures that we need to be able to dismantle uh, racial disparities. So thank you all for listening in. It was an honor uh, to facilitate this panel and thank you to the city of Dallas and Community Foundation of Texas for inviting me to do so. Um, we look forward to um, sharing more with you all around the racial equity plan has been mentioned a few times, um, and we'll be able to present more about that later today. So thank you all so much for listening into this panel and hope everyone has a, a great uh, weekend and, and stays uh, safe and healthy. Hi, everyone. I'm not sure if I'm next, actually, but I will say that we have a brief interlude with information from our team, our partners at the city from planning and urban development. We're going to talk just very briefly about our four Dallas process and how you can engage. It's the work of everyone, right, to forward and advance equity. And our friends and partners at PUD are doing just that by being present with us. So I'm turning it over to our colleagues at Planning and Urban Design to talk a little bit about Four Dallas and how you can participate and engage with them. Thank you. Can y'all hear me? All right, perfect. Uh, so my name is Lawrence Agu, and I am the chief planner within our planning urban design department. Um, I'm here to create, uh, show just a quick commercial about Fort Dallas and what we're doing and how that's plugging into uh, the discussion that we've talked about and we've been talking about uh, during this, this morning. Uh, so Fort Dallas is the city's current comprehensive plan that was adopted in 2006, uh, but a lot has changed between 2006 and now uh, from growing population, housing needs, transportation, et cetera. Uh, but to put that in perspective, um, it's important to note that in 2007, the iPhone was created when that changed the way we communicate with each other. In 2008, the housing crash occurred, which changed the way housing financing uh, is happening in the US. Uh, 2009, Uber was founded, uh, which introduced transportation on demand or mobility as a service. And 2010 to now represents some of the most severe disasters, um, in, uh, natural disasters and climate change documented in modern history. So it's important that um, a comprehensive plan uh, basically addresses all those changes that have happened since the uh, 2006 initial uh, plan that was created and, and sent out to the city of Dallas. Uh, so what are we trying to address and why are we doing it now? So 
a few of the things that we've, we've been researching and looking at are one, racial inequities weren't really addressed uh, from a land use perspective in an in initial plan. And that's something we wanna address in this particular version. Uh, two, neighborhood led plans weren't really integrated into the process. So in, in terms of a comprehensive plan, it's important that we're comprehensive in terms of the scales of um, policy and, uh, and research that we're doing when we're looking for, for ideas for moving forward with policy changes. And also too, there was a lack of implementation measures and tools that were spelled out within the initial plan. So the, the job that we're looking at is to ensure that there's a way to implement what we do propose um, in this next round. And also moving forward, uh, some of the, the plans um, and then the policies that were in there didn't really align with um, current policy. So it's important that we try to link um, current policies, other plans that have been developed, uh, i.e. Uh, CCAP and other um, policies that have been recently developed into for Dallas. Uh, also the land use vision didn't really represent the desires of the community like we mentioned. And also we need to account for the the growth uh, and then increasing growth demands that is happening and occurring in the city of Dallas. So when it comes to addressing inequity, it's important that we learn and we look back into the past to figure out which elements um, and which policies uh, and constructs led to where we are now. Um, so just, just a quick timeline in terms of a few of the things that we have identified uh, just as city staff uh, doing research into land use inequities, um, looking at how uh, certain policies like you know, the Dallas in 1921 passed um, a one race neighborhoods as law um, and moving forward to 1929, which is only eight years later, the first uh, Dallas zoning ordinance was adopted. So just thinking through how some of these more inequitable uh, actions occurred in tandem with a lot of the policy changes and and things that were happening from a land use perspective. And also, as we mentioned, um, looking back into the past and everybody or most people probably know about redlining maps and how that um, led to a lot of inequities that occurred in the city. Um, in addition to that segregation that was built into the zoning and land use practices um, led to inequitable land distribution, uh, led to inequitable concentrations of people and also led to inequitable um, opportunities to access. So it's important that we know what um, the redlining and, and similar type of tools did in terms of creating land use uh, disparities and also looking up to now where other um, entities such as the Smart Growth um, Dallas uh, Equity uh, Research, which is done by TPL, uh, Trust for Public Land, they've looked at basically a suite of all the land use inequities that have occurred and mapped that for, for the public to, to view and understand where, where are particular areas that are doing worse or better uh, when it comes to a land use inequity perspective. Uh, so now that we have a quick uh, understanding of what uh, for Dallas is and uh, where we were and how we looked at it in the, in, the, in the past, looking up to now, I uh, want to delve a little bit more into what land use is. Uh, so land use is a system of organizing uses of our land uh, to meet the community's needs. So as mentioned before in the previous slides, uh, the intent behind uh, organizing land um, into different, um, I guess, locales or different um, areas was actually to protect single families from encroachment of uh, common nuisances. Um, so that was done in sometimes in an inequitable fashion, but the, the purpose of uh, land use is to organize land in a way that best serves a community uh, based on what the community's desires are. Uh, so it's important also to note that zoning and land use are two different things. Uh, zoning is the primary tool that cities use to control or enforce land use decisions. So it's basically a policing tool um, that uh, communities use to enforce the vision, land use visions uh, that a community develops or proposes through uh, land use policy. Um, and that, that's kind of something I want to mention and, and clarify as we go through this process that we're not changing the zoning specifically, but we're looking to change and think through land use um, um, composition 
And then that vision will help policymakers uh, determine how to use zoning to, to enforce and lead up to the policies and the vision that our community wants. Uh, so why does it matter? What, what's, the, what's the point of looking into land use? So land use influences a lot of things as we mentioned. Um, it's, it's a guiding policy document um, and informs and makes decisions around like, zoning change, like I mentioned, but also too um, is tied uh, very in integrally to transportation, uh, to the character of your neighborhood and economic opportunities. Um, those are just a few of the things that land use ties into. And it's important that um, we get feedback from the community to be able to voice what they actually want in their communities from a land use perspective that ties into all the different elements um, that are integral uh, with that as well. Uh, so for Dallas, this cannot be done without the community, as I mentioned multiple times. Um, on the screen, there are a few QR codes that we have um, that link to our website and a survey that we're getting and soliciting feedback from the community regarding uh, land use uh, priorities, land use issues and concerns. Uh, the first link is a link to our website, uh, Dallas City Hall forward slash uh, forward Dallas. Uh, the second you know, QR code, and I'll also put these on the, on the chat. Uh, this is where you can sign up to be notified uh, with any updates that we are uh, currently doing throughout the process. And then also too, we have a survey link, uh, bit.ly forward slash uh, FWD Dallas survey. Uh, that is that that link will be remaining the same throughout the process. We'll be updating that survey um, as we go into getting feedback from an issue perspective. Uh, when we go into visioning what particular people want, and then as we get into um, confirming what the community wants, this will be the main survey link that we'll be using. So uh, just make sure you get a copy of the QR code. We'll again, we'll put the link on the chat. Um, and also, too, uh, we are also available uh, through email um, if you want a city of Dallas, uh, especially planning urban design department to come to your neighborhood organization or the, uh, basically present um, this or other other um, presentations related to land use. Uh, we have an open call. Um, you can email us at PUD at DallasCityHall.com and we can also talk through um, what's happening in your community and then see how we can best um and, and incorporate your thoughts and your opinions into this process and lastly we are available um, on social media uh, facebook um, uh, twitter and instagram uh, the same um, handle at dallas plan ud um, you can reach us and we'll also be pushing information from our survey updates that are happening within this particular plan um, and also fielding questions within those uh, mobile platforms or social media platforms. So again, thank you all so much for uh, attending and being involved in uh, the critical work that we're doing here at the city of Dallas. We're so glad that we have a lot of participants and we're hoping that more um, can come on board through this process before Dallas. Thank you so much. No, thank you, Lawrence for the brief overview of Forward Dallas and your work. It's a prime example really of how Dallas is baking equity principles into our planning processes and, and eventual policy. And also thank you for the Spanish translations. Muchas gracias. I would like to highlight the five divisions within the Office of Equity and Inclusion, our Human Rights Division, our Welcoming Communities and Immigrant Affairs Division, Fair Housing Division, our Resilience Division, and of course, our equity division that is leading the symposium today. We work to infuse equity and inclusion and social justice into our work and across the city. And you can find our new and improved updated webpage in the chat. Please contact us and let us know how we can be of best service.